speaking, mute yourself. Um, if necessary, we'll try to, to mute you if we found that there's excessive background noise, uh, but keep that in mind throughout the call. Um, also, uh, please, if you are interested in presenting in the next workshop that would be held Wednesday, December 15, um, that uh, workshop will be a recap on Slice of Day. So if you are interested in presenting, please contact the co-facilitators for that meeting by this Friday and send uh, your presentation materials by the next Friday, uh, December the 10th. Um, in these meetings, um, we'll uh, generally, uh, as we've discussed before, uh, maybe look at some more um, complete versions of, of proposals. So uh, please bear that in mind. Also, uh, another reminder that the next uh, set of, of comments is due the 22nd of December. This is an informal set of comments and it will cover the two um, workshops on need determination and allocation and the recap of slice of day. Um, so with those uh, reminders, uh, again, this is Sergio Duenas from CISA. Uh, I'll be uh, facilitating this uh, first half of the meeting today. And in the afternoon, my colleague Gino will take over. Um, I like to give you some updates uh, from uh, items that we uh, talked about um, last uh, last meeting. Uh, first off, uh, there were several parties that commented um, that they would uh, support having uh, an additional workshop on storage matters. Um, as you may have seen from the, the email uh, sent out yesterday, um, sorry, on, on Monday, uh, we'll have an additional workshop on Friday, um, the 17th of December. We'll be providing more information on that uh, later on. Uh, but if again, if you want to present, uh, um, and bear, bear in mind that you would need to reach out uh, ahead of time. Um, for the Wednesday, uh, December the 15th meeting, um, uh, again, just if you are interested in presenting and you would uh, communicate that uh, later, uh, the third, uh, bear in mind that uh, the your deck should be a proposal uh, and a, 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 you, you should provide a, a deck for your proposal, but also a, a, a brief on uh, a written brief on your proposal as well, so that parties will have a better idea of um, what uh, you know the the inner work of that idea. And uh, finally, um, the co-facilitators uh, for all meetings, uh, we 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 had a coordination call. And in order to ease uh, comparison of different ideas, we will be releasing two surveys. Uh, one rank the uh, elements that. Uh, please remain muted if you are not uh, speaking. Okay. Um, so we'll be releasing two surveys: one to rank the elements. Um, basically asking, uh, do do you think, for example, that a net uh, load approach uh, should be preferred or a gross load approach, uh, et cetera? Um, and we will also provide another uh, survey to rank the proposals that will be discussed on December 15th. Um, a specific group of co-facilitators is working on this. Uh, CISA is among them, uh, the CAISO, SE, and other parties too. Uh, Excuse me if I didn't mention all of them. I, I don't recall who, who's there specifically, but we'll be working on those and uh, sending those out to get a better sense of what topics are uh, uh, mostly consensus or which ones we have more of a split opinion among the group. Um, yeah, so with that, I think that um, covers the 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 housekeeping elements of of the beginning of the call. I don't know, uh, Lisa, if you might have anything to add. Did I forget anything? I think I covered it all. <laughs> you covered everything, Sergio. Awesome. Um, so uh, the timing of the surveys. That's a that's a good question. 
we are planning on sending uh, an initial uh, draft of the, the surveys this week, uh, mainly the proposal one, sorry, the elements one. Um, the proposal one will follow the, the proposal presentations on the 15th. So the first survey is about elements, and the second one is about the proposals that we'll hear on December 15th. So with that, uh, today we have a pretty full schedule. Um, as you can see in the invite for today, we've extended the meeting so that we have enough time for uh, questions as well. So I'd like to pass it on to the first presenters, um, which I believe it's uh, Kao Wea. Okay, um, I think I'm supposed to make the presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you that. Perfect, perfect. So I'm going to bring up my presentation. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my slide. Yes, we can see your slide. Okay, and you can see it in this presentation mode, maybe even better. So um, mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we have been um, um, supporting, generally supporting the concept of net load and doing the entire um, RA evaluation and RA assessment uh, based on net load, but uh, based on some additional thinking, Rather than using net load for actual RA framework, we, we are going back to supporting gross load, uh, but using net load um, as, as a way of calculating the qualifying capacity of wind and solar resources. So the concept is very simple. Uh, we'll, we'll present it today. Um, and hopefully everybody finds it simple and as rational as we think it is. Um, we, we somehow use strong words in referring to other methods. Please forgive, forgive that. I'll, I'll avoid using those strong words. They are unfortunately in, in my writing. So, um, first of all, let, let's state the obvious. Um, we we know the we, the current RA framework everybody knows it's it's, it's doesn't work uh, when you have um, um, energy limited resources and especially if those are variable energy resources like wind and solar resources and by the way when I say variable energy resources I mean wind and solar the other types of variable energy resources like one of it river hydro, but I'm talking about wind and solar when I talk about variable energy resources. So rather than saying wind and solar, I'll, I'll refer to them as bears. Um, there's some, some, some sort of accepted in the industry bears uh, to apply to refer to wind and solar resources. Um, the they, they current framework has been working simply because we, the system was full of non-variable energy resources, dispatchable resources, uh, and uh, whatever we, as, uh, we assign to them as the qualifying capacity would, would, um, would be more or less available at other times. Uh, and so if the time of critical system needs shifted around, they, they still would be available with, based on quali uh, the, the qualifying capacity or NQC2 meet the demand. We are discovering that um, it, it won't work anymore. And, um, and as I will mention, even if you recalculate, when it comes, especially when it comes to variable energy resources, even if you calculate the QC in the best available fashion, um, and but we kept the current framework the, the same, um, we we uh, we would see that uh, calculating a single number for uh, for for VERS and 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 relying on them is is is, is the wrong decision. 
So this is one of the, um, among the many reasons why we support slice of day proposal. This is one of the reasons, because during a, if the slice of day are properly selected, you can at least be more certain that bears are going to behave um, in a predictable fashion within that slice. Uh, um, um, within that slice, um, and and you can uh, have a RA framework that works uh, at least for this, among many other reasons that makes slice of day more superior to any other thoughts we have had. Um, this this was one of the reasons that made made us very uh, stand behind it and support it. Um, but even within this superior paradigm, it's still difficult to, um, still we need to find out what should be the qualifying capacity of VERS. Well, um, why not use ELCC? Um, as we know, ELCC comes up with a single number and that would be um, that that would apply to all hours of a of, of a um, slice, and um, and and it it may not be um, um, it, and we, we know that 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 number is 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 not going to be may not be. Um, um, applicable for, for that hour of the slice, which which is the most critical one. Everybody's talking about 8 p.m. during a summer evening slice. So uh, while we calculate a, a ELCC-based qualifying capacity for a resource, for, an, for a VAR, um, that, that happens to be one number for that slice, it may not work for 8 p.m. We may see uh, uh, variation there. The second reason is ELCC is not easy to calculate, and and it, it's a black product of a black box by and large, at least the way we use it in California, um, and um, well, it, almost everywhere else. But the way, and and it can be misinterpreted, misinterpreted, miscalculated, as we and there are examples of people using ELCC and coming up with different numbers um, for the same year, for the same type of resources and so on. So, um, um, and I, as I said, it's, it's very complex uh, calculation and, and calculating is, is, is using, using ELCC can be difficult in that process. Um, I guess this this expresses my my opinion of exceedance uh, method. Um, we have for years um, argued against exceedance method as being totally arbitrary. Um, I, I use the word crapshoot here, but I meant I meant arbitrary. Um, if, in 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 the sense that um, if Maybe I could use this example. Um, if you look at, for example, wind production uh, during a particular month here, hours of a particular month being our October, or, um, and you're looking at wind production at here. Um, which, which is used in calculating exceedance. We don't know whether during this time, at this number when wind was producing, what the load was. We, we calculate exceedance number completely independent of load. We, we ignore load. We, 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 we look at just the performance of the, of the, of the um, resource not whether that performance helps you with managing load, help you provide RA capacity, helps you provide your net, cap net need to 
so that you get RA capacity from dispatchable resources. You don't know that. You just focus on the resource itself. And, and when it comes to 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, that's another arbitrary decision, more or less. The best example of an effort in, in walking away from arbitrariness was the presentation we saw recently from PG&E, in which they talked about how um, some level of the, the, the focusing on correlation between um, production from a, a VAR, a variable energy resource, and the load, try to sort of come up with general correlation between a VAR and VAR output and, and, and the load to say it seems that 60% looks like a better number. 60% exceedance looks like, for wind, for example, looks like a good number. So um, the ELCC, ELCC is, 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 is very a good solution because it, it doesn't give capacity to a resource unless it, it helps reduce wind. And if you can apply ELCC to a smaller slice, um, even the results would be better, but still the complexity will remain complex they're using the LCC. Exceedance um, suffers from several level, levels of arbitrariness. And if you have to um, use uh, exceedance to calculate the RA capacity of resources based on a location, a zone, a, a CRES, uh, or a particular wind technology type one or type three or type four, or offshore and so on, things can be even more difficult and more arbitrary. So um, in that regard, um, and in, in as we were following through with the, um, we were just thinking through this net load concept using net load for our, in the RA framework, we came up with a very simple approach called net load reduction methodology for calculating qualifying capacity of VERS or capacity counting, as we call it. And it, it, it is based on a perf capturing perfect correlation, but perfectly capturing the correlation between uh, load and VERS output. And, and, and the process is as simple as um, look at historical data, and if you're focusing on an hour, either because you want to focus on that one hour only, or we, you want to focus on hours that, um, all the hours that fit within a, a slice of day, you basically, for, for every hour, you, and I have this example. I'm going to take you through this example. This is our 5,669, 5, which happens to be a, an evening, early evening hour in August 28. Uh, well, I don't know 8 p.m. is early evening or not, but uh, for some is early evening. For me, it's almost close to bedtime. Um, and um, the gross load assume is um, 42,000 megawatt. Uh, wind output is about actual, this is actual gross load, assuming that it's actual measured gross load. We have this information. We know what gross load is. Uh, um, and these are historical data, by the way. Uh, wind output is 1,000 megawatt. Solar output is, is 500 megawatts during that time. And um, and by the way, wind interconnection capacity is 5,000 megawatt. I, I think we have to get used to the idea of wind interconnection capacity or solar interconnection capacity rather than wind installed capacity because um, uh, California ISO and limits the output of the units 
regardless of the installed capacity to the interconnection capacity. So anyway, um, if, if wind output is 1,000 megawatt, this is actual wind output during the 42,000, when the load at this particular hour happened to be 42,000 megawatt. Um, in that case, we come up with a number, we call it NLR factor, net load reduction factor for wind for this particular hour, 5,669, to be 20%. The net load, net load reduction factor for solar, based on these numbers, would be 5%. Now, if you have a number of years, well, this, this hour applies. And, and of course, you have, and this, and, and you're thinking about a slice of day, say summer season slice number five or four, which is the evening hour. There are a bunch of hours that fits within that slice. For every one of those hours, for all the years that we're looking at, we can calculate the, the NLR factor, net load reduction factor. And for wind and solar, and then average those out. One approach would be to average those out. There could be, we want to maybe uh, use other ways of using the NLR factors for wind and solar to calculate the qual qualifying capacity of the wind and solar for that slice of day. So you would look at all the hours that belong to those, and for every one of those hours, you, you, you can calculate this number with accounting for perfect correlation between um, gross load and wind production or solar production and um, calculate the NLR factor, then you can average these numbers out to come to calculate the qualifying capacity of wind or solar for all the hours that belong to that slice. Um, there may be other formulation that could be used to go from NLR factor uh, to uh, NLR-based qualifying capacity. So in this very simple fashion, you can calculate qualif and very, very everything is verifiable is because it's based on historical data that is available. And, and, and better than that, if, if you want to do this calculation on a zonal basis, you focus on wind and solar generation in that zone, and, and you do the qualifying capacity, calculate qual the NLR factor as from, from there, um, the qualifying capacity for wind and solar resources in that particular zone. Um, or if you want to talk talk about maybe solar PV versus solar um, um, thermal or other reasons uh, to distinguish between technologies, you can do the same thing based on availability of gross load and, and actual wind or solar production per technology. So it, the process is simple, record keeping, and um, simple map. Um, okay, so um, this is the the basic concept. Um, as you can see, it's readily applicable to um, 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 hang on. Uh, it's readily applicable uh, um, to um, uh, usable. Uh, it's based on actual data, ca perfect correlation between um, load and wind production and solar production, um, and can be readily adapted into um, slice of day. It can do things based on technology, based on location. Um, I, I wanted to say one more thing uh, in the context of uh, one of the issues which we are we, we, we are puzzled by the 
by the fact that people are having a hard time between top down, top down versus bottom up approach, which one works, which should be used and so on. We have always said that for determining the need, the amount of RA capacity that has to be procured as determined to be determined by ISO or, or PUC, we should use a top-down approach. In other words, we should look at system need um, on ISO level so that we, we know what, how much, how, how many megawatts of RA capacity is, is needed how many megawatts of new RA capacity is needed um, um, going forward. And allocating that um, RA capacity uh, need to various LSEs, we should use a bottom, bottom up approach. Um, For every slice of day, top-down approach will identify the amount of total RA system need. And then, of course, by looking at available RA resources, um, those are the, that are owned or contracted by various LSEs. And, and of course, when it comes to wind and solar resources, using, using the qualifying capacity, using NLR method, and, of course, um, the livability approach that ISO has. Um, we will know for that slice of day that we are short, say, 5,000 megawatt of RA capacity. Then for that slice of day, you would look at every LSE and see how they fare based on the uh, gross loads during that slice of day minus all the RA resources they have lined, lined up for that slice of day. So, um, and, and, and basically, um, we, we calculate RA shortfall per each LSE, and that becomes simply an allocator to, to, to allocate the top-down, uh, the, the system need identified as part of the top-down approach. So, um, but um, just wanted to put this also out because we, we are hearing that people somehow have uh, are discussing whether we should use top down or bottom up on approach. Each one has its own place, top down for determining system need. Otherwise, we would, uh, if we go from bottom up to go calculate system need, we will overshoot the system need by, by a lot. And if you go, um, um, if you s stick to top down, we won't will not know the exact contribution of each uh, each entity, especially if you do top down and then use some simply load share, which is to me a disaster um, because dosha does not identify the need. Shortfall, RA shortfall, does an RA shortfall for each slice of day should be calculated on a bottom up approach. With that, um, I, I understand that there are many questions. So um, if the people want to ask those questions um, and I, I have time to answer them, I would like to do that. Unfortunately, I have to disappear after lunch. So um, it would be good uh, if we ask those questions earlier rather than later. Yeah, thanks for that, Dariush. Uh, you have five minutes left of your allotted time, so let's take a couple of questions if we can. So first off, we had Brian Beering. Hi, Dariush. This is Brian Beering for American Clean Power. Um, in the past, uh, in the past workshops, I've expressed a pretty significant concern with the net load uh, reduction methodology for counting uh, qualifying capacity, and it's really arisen in the context of thinking this through with all the procurement that's underway, in particular from the IRP process. And, you know, right now, I think we, we understand what the ELCC is. We know how to contract around the ELCC, but I think with the net load reduction methodology, it's just not clear to us how that would be a transactable product. You know, how do we transact around something that's either being netted off of gross load, you know, across the system who's paying for that, 
Um, if it's on an LSC specific basis, how do we transact with that specific LSC when their determination of their need is going to be sometime in the future before the resources, you know, after the resources are connected? Um, so can you kind of help me think through the transactability element of your proposal? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that we understand that uh, this framework, uh, going from what we have today, this monthly framework we have now to the slice of day, there will be some shift in, in the way transactions will be done, the way everything will be done. So some, some change will be necessary anyway. Um, but when it comes to this issue, we are not talking about net load reduction in the concept of, we, we still deal with things in gross load terms going forward and so on. Net load is only used to calculate qualifying capacity. We calculate qualifying capacity of various resources based on historical data, nothing more. And we calculate one number of qualifying capacity for a slice number five of, of summer season. Let's call it summer season, a slice number five or four, whatever is critical. Um, is going to be, for wind, is going to be 20%. And that number is, is, is going to stick to wind going forward. Now, from time to time, the RA capacity of resources, as the ELCC shows today, will change, and we will see that change. <clears throat> um, and we can make that change as, as um, infrequent as possible by making, making changes um, every few years. Currently, ELCC numbers are changing every year. Um, so, um, but the idea is to calculate the QC number of, of wind and solar, either per zone, per technology, or overall wind or overall soaps once, and those numbers will stay. So after that, when wind and solar uh, uh, qualifying capacities are known uh, based on this NLR approach as opposed to um, ELCC, which we still believe ELCC is a superior technique, um, but it's difficult to stay, to, to keep on, especially in the context of slice of day, will be difficult to administer and calculate. Once we have these numbers, these numbers are going to stay. It's not like we are going to change them every minute or and, and, and we can make the change process updating of these NLR factors as more and more renewables uh, varies or added and, and we have more data. Uh, we can make those happen at, um, at uh, different times, maybe every four years, every three years. And, um, but the, 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 once the, the numbers are known, they are known, and I don't see any issue with the transactability at that time. Okay, um, let's take one more question. Uh, Bridget Sparks from Kaizon, please, uh, people asking questions on there, let's try to be succinct to respect the time of others. Thanks, so um, a couple, more comments and question is I actually think you're showing an indirect correlation rather than a direct correlation with load because the amount of wind and solar production is driven by weather patterns which are correlated with load but load doesn't have a direct correlation with wind and solar output and so I feel like it's a faulty um, it seems like it's the wrong thing you want to calculate it seems more so that you really want to calculate what is the winter solar production at different weather profiles. Um, and so I worry that this method doesn't have any meaningful predictions for the future um, because the solar output's really driven by, I mean, obviously time of day, but also the weather. And so to say that for any specific hour in the future, you know, May weather patterns could be very different. And so if you're basing your um, values on sort of the last three years of data, but if we have a really hot May, um, you may get a very different wind output. And so to say that you want to correlate with load, I think is the wrong metric and isn't really meaningful for like future 
qualifying capacity because if load increases, that doesn't have it has no like direct cause on what the wind and solar output is. That's all driven by weather patterns. Um, and I also don't really see how this method is that much different from exceedance because you're still, and maybe you're just doing a mean rather than a 60 or 70% exceedance, but you're still looking at sort of historically for the same time period, what was the output and then taking that value and putting it into the future. Um, so it seems to me like ELCC, if you're trying to get the values to correlate with something, it, it seems like ELCC, because it does the stochastic draws of the wind and solar patterns, will get you a better estimate of what these resources can produce under similar conditions in the future. Um, so just kind of some, some room for thought around you know, maybe how you're framing this. And, and I think what's really driving the values of these resources is the wind, is the wind and so, you know, sun. And so finding it maybe is there a better way to, to directly measure that rather than trying to say it's correlated with load. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, acknowledge that the correlation is with weather, but when it, we're looking in the future and we are thinking about whether how much contribution wind or solar will have, we are, in other words, when it comes to making transaction happen, makes, making sure that we have enough resources lined up to deal with future, we don't deal with weather, we, we, le we deal with gross load. So we need to establish the relationship with gross load, and that's what we are precisely doing here. So while I understand that as far as relationship is concerned, the, the relationship is with weather, but in, in, in this framework that we are dealing with, we are not buying for weather in the future, we are buying for gross load, and we are calculating need based on gross load, so we need to know how wind and solar are reacting, at least have been historically reacting um, to, to gross load over the years and, and, um, and, and expecting this, this will apply. I completely object to your statement that this is similar to exceedance. Exceedance is, is you just pick, at a, pick a percentage of generation without looking at whether that percentage had anything to do with load reduction or not. Here we are focusing on making sure that we we mat, we subtract a, a a load gross load at a particular time with wind or solar production at that very specific time. So um, now we, whether you want to use exceedance at least at, against that net load that comes out of it or net reduction, that's another matter. But the exceedance as we use it now totally ignores the impact on load by, by restricting it to particular hours or maybe one hour, maybe things get better. But um, outside that, um, when you do exceedance, you only focus on generation. You don't look at its impact on load at all. Here, we, we, we capture the impact on load as as perfectly as we can based on actual reduction in load that happened happened historically. Now we know both of those load and generation are connected together through weather, um, among other things. But for now, for at least for transactability, for uh, being able to manage um, the, this grid, we need a relationship between load and and the contribution of wind and solar to low, and that's what this method does. Okay, um, thanks for that, Darius. I see there's four people in the queue. I've uh, taken those names down so that uh, you can be the first four in our uh, Q and A uh, session before lunch, so that Darius is still available. Um, so if you can lower your hands, Noah, Nick, uh, Matthew, and Doug. And let's uh, move on to SCE's presentation. 
a CE you'll have until 11-11 uh, so that you still get 30 minutes. Um, but um, thank you and we'll uh, tend those questions as soon as we can prior to lunch. Great, uh, good morning. Uh, it's Jeff Nelson here with SCE, uh, Director of our Perk Rates and Market Integration Group. And we also have with us uh, Brent. Yeah, uh, Brent Buffington, uh, Principal Manager of Integrated Resource Planning. Okay, just for bandwidth sake, I'm gonna go off camera. Uh, can people see a slide that says need determination under a 24 hour slice? Okay, very good. Well, thanks thanks everyone for having us today. Uh, we wanna talk about, uh, in the context of the 24 hour framework that we've been exploring from SCE's perspective, uh, what do you do with the load shapes? And I'm gonna make an observation in general that in any of these sort of slice of systems, whether it be 24 hours or however many hours in a, 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 in a slices that you're looking at, we have to move away from the current RA system, which is based on a certain point. It's a point in time, it's a point capacity, it's a peak load point. We have to add a temporal dimension. We have to, we have to somehow transform what we're currently doing as a single point into a whole day's worth of data. And in our framework, it's a 24 hours. So it's a sort of a common problem uh, or a common just sort of evolution of how we're doing things. Uh, so what we want to talk about is how are we going to get 24 hours worth of load shape and how are we going to go from the way we do things today to a more robust uh, hourly load profile for each LSC. And we want to start with a couple bookends uh, that are sort of uh, at the extremes of what you could do and not necessarily that an extreme is bad, but they're just at the end of the book bookshelves. And then something on a middle ground that we've been thinking about and discuss sort of pros and cons on how to do this. So in any any slice framework, we're going to have to convert a single point to multiple points. And uh, it's it's still my view that to, to do that in any framework, you're going to have to have the 24 hours worth of data, uh, even if you aggregate up. OK, so what are we trying to do? What are some of our principles here? Well, first thing is. In our framework, and I'll just stay in my framework or SE framework from here on out, we want to make sure that we meet the ISO's needs in every hour of the day, a 24 hour profile, not just the peak, not just the gross peak. Every hour of the day, we want to make sure we've got resources there. And that means we're going to need an hourly 24 hour profile for all of our loads. So we want to be able sure we can meet the ISO's total system needs. I think Darish was talking about that. You sort of top down, you've got to get the entire thing. But then we've got to look at each individual LSC, and we're going to have to come up with a load shape, 24-hour load shape for every individual LSC. And uh, we've got some principles here. Uh, the methodology needs to be reasonable, fair, transparent to everybody. We, we're not trying to throw any certain class of LSC to a subsidy or, a, or, or, or where they're being harmed. We think everyone, regardless of what sort of load shape they're serving, needs to be treated in a fair way. Uh, and easier said than done, unfortunately. Uh, next major constraint we have is a process has to be administratively feasible. So I, I, I just would encourage everyone as we're talking through all these issues, we have to actually be able to do it. Uh, we're gonna rely heavily in our, our approach, at least for this discussion, on the CEC. And uh, where we see roles and responsibilities, we're trying to parallel as much as we can uh, as we do today, where the CEC will be sort of the ultimate arbitrator and the ultimate determiner of what the LSC's load shape is. And uh, so we, we would like to keep a system where people make a proposal, there's some sort of scrutiny, some sort of adjustment, and then ultimately the CEC comes out with what each LSC's load shape is. And there'll have to be some adjustments based on various things. We'll talk about some of those. Okay, so the, the end point of this is we're gonna discuss, I'll just jump to a quick picture because I think better in pictures. We have a total system load shape. We've got to figure out which each LSE's load shape is that they're going to have to serve from an RA requirement. So the whole point of this discussion is figuring out what that LSE's 24-hour load shape looks like. That's what we're doing. We've got sort of three methodologies we want to talk about. Uh, first one is a bookend, and it is the simplest. <laughs> you start with the ISO's total load shape, and then you use some metric. How about gross peak? and you give a pro rata share of this load shape to every LSE based on, for example, their gross peak. 
So everyone would have the same shape. It would just be scaled depending on how big they were, but everyone would be serving the same shape. Uh, under our proposal, we look at kind of the worst day of the month. So everyone's going to have a shape that's a scaled version of the worst day of the month for all 24 hours. So it'd be very easy mechanically. We just need to have the CEC ultimately determine what that worst day profile looks like, figure out what each person's, each LLC's gross peak share is. There might be some correlation adjustment or, or, or a coincident adjustment. There might be, but pretty much simple numbers, stuff we do, and everyone gets the same load shapes, just scaled. Uh, really easy to do, quote unquote easy, but it doesn't recognize that LSCs could have very different load shapes. Uh, and simply scaling the ISO load shape will re result in cross subsidies. So we don't like it from sort of a fairness standpoint, but from an administrative standpoint, hey, I like it. It, it seems like it's doable. So it's a bookend. Uh, I don't expect a lot of people to support this, but it is a bookend. Uh, now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And here I'll say fully custom load shapes for each LSC. And here, every LSC would work whatever it does through its magic of numbers and say, this is what my 24 hour load shape looks like on the worst day. And they'd submit that to the CEC and the CEC would then work its numerical magic to uh, validate, adjust, determine what it really thinks is going on and what the right numbers are. And it would return back uh, a profile to each LSC. Um, so there's going to have to be a bunch of additional verification processes. Right now we go through quite a rigmarole, if that's the right term, to get a single point verified and adjusted. But here we have to do it for 24 points uh, for 70 LSEs, uh, 12 months in a year under our proposal. So that's a lot of data. It's a lot of verification, a lot of validation. And I think the pro on this is, you know, if everyone does things just right, it's really reflecting people's load shapes and they're getting their uh, proper, proper RA requirements. The con though is the administrative complexity and I, I you know, I just been through enough regulatory processes. It seems, how, how are we going to quote unquote litigate this? How is there enough time in a year to litigate each one of these custom load shapes every month with 70 some LSEs. So the con here is the time and the complexity that it'll be to uh, get the shapes decided upon and, and, and time for whatever process is needed for people to sort of go back and forth and fine tuning. So it's great if it can work smoothly, it'll be the perfect shape or the best shape we can get but it also is complex because it could be heavily litigated and there's just not time to litigate this much information. Okay, so those are sort of the two ends of the, the shelves. Everyone gets the exact same shape. Everyone has a very unique and custom shape and sort of the extremes of the litigation side is sort of like pure math, there's nothing to talk about versus every single point, there's something to talk about on the other end. So our thinking was maybe there's a middle ground Maybe there's a way we can be fair, sort of reasonable to everybody uh, and sort of expedite the process, make it a little more mathematical and mechanical. And uh, we're thinking about a, a way you know, for consideration of something we call semi-custom LSC shapes. And under this concept, each LSC would not only figure out what sort of its gross load was, but we break its load into different classes of customers. And they'd be responsible for it, uh, disclosing or, or, or proposing uh, their peak load, how it was decomposed into different customer class groups. And I'll, I'll walk through an example on a spreadsheet coming up. And here we would, for these customer class groups, similar to what we're proposing for wind and solar, we'd come up with a 24 hour profile for what these customer class looks like by month. Maybe we could do it by season and apply the same shape for multiple months, but just conceptually, we'd have a different profile for each month. So what this lets us do is it lets us transform a single point number. What is customer class A's load during your gross peak? A single number. We'd multiply it in effect by a load shape, a 24 hour load shape, and transform that point number into a load shape. And it wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't be absolutely custom, custom, custom done but it would be reasonable for that customer class. We'd have the CEC, we believe, figure out what a shape would be. We'd apply the shape. And then for each one of the customer classes they have in their portfolio, we'd apply that shape. 
and then we'd ultimately just add up all the shapes. We'd have to do a little bit of fine tuning to make sure the sum equals the total, and uh, that would be it. So it would be a showing where the customer would say, the LLC would say, here's my gross peak number, and here's how I decompose it into the customer classes. And then the rest would be mathematical and mechanical based on profiles. Um, we would have to develop the profiles. Here's some of the cons. We have to develop the shapes here. We have to figure out what classes are. And uh, we have to be able to make sure that the LSEs can report this information. I've gotten some feedback that some of the ways we proposed here may not be feasible for LSEs because the data may be mixed together and they can't separate the classes out. Something we'd have to talk about. It has to be something that everyone can agree is separable and doable. Uh, and there still is some verification issues. Uh, we still have the issue of how the CEC verifies the point estimate the person's making in the breakdown. But we think it's a lot easier to verify, if you will, four pieces or five pieces of information rather than 8760 worth of information on fully custom load shapes. So I'm going to just jump really quickly. Oh, the pros here. If we can agree to load shapes and classes and everyone has that data, it's pretty administratively feasible. And it would definitely recognize the difference between LSEs. You know, it wouldn't be a perfect load shape, but it would definitely get the general shape right for the LSEs. And it would it wouldn't, would prevent some of the cross subsidies and, you know, treat people fairly. Not perfectly, but fairly. And by doing a little tune-up, we'd make sure that the, 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 the sum equaled the whole, meaning that uh, when we added everybody up, we met the ISO's total peak. Okay, Brent, I've done a lot of nonstop talking. Is there anything you wanted to throw in before I go into examples? Uh, no, uh, let's move on to examples, uh, just in the interest of time. Okay. Uh, so I apologize if not everyone has our slides. I understand they're posted at the PUC at this stage. Uh, we tried to get them out. Uh, we had a little bit of a, a timing issue. I apologize for that. So the slides will be made available. Uh, I think someone posted a link earlier. Uh, we've talked about this, uh, what we have to do for the new showings, the peaks and the classes and the breakdowns. And the CEC plays a heavy role in this. Okay, so let me get to let me get to some numbers here. So here we've got an example where we have uh, three LSEs, and we're going to be jump back for these charts. We've got the LSEs as different colors, and we have the ISO's total system peak is sort of a red line here. So here are three LSEs. Uh, they've each said, "Hey, look, uh, on a forecast basis, this is the load I'm going to have during." whatever we determine in this proposal, the gross load peak is going to be, and say that the LC1 is 15,000. And moreover, and again, for illustrative purposes, we said, well, let's let's imagine we have different classes of load, residential, commercial, industrial, and other. And again, I've gotten some feedback that it may not be separable, commercial and industrial, because they may be on the same tariff. So we need to make sure that the data is available for whatever classes we come up with. Uh, and they total 15,000. And here's the breakdown. Okay, so it's you know, it's that their peak plus a breakdown. And then we have two other LSEs that have done the same thing. And then uh, besides the individual LSEs, we have what the ISO's overall system is. We're viewing this as a system-wide allocation. It might wind up being a zonal-wide or attack area-wide. You just have to have uh, the load that's in that area match that area. So I'm just saying system-wide, so it's everybody in there. If it was TAC, it would be all the load in that TAC. Uh, however, we ultimately break it down. But system-wide, it's easier to see, and that's that's sort of what we've played with here. So we have the CEC develop the worst day, 24-hour profile. And we just couldn't fit all 24 hours here, but we've got hours one, two, three, dot, dot, dots. We're using hour 18 as sort of the crucial peak, uh, gross peak hour that we're gonna, we're gonna collect all the data for. And then what we've done, or the CEC and our model's done, as I said, for each one of the customer classes, we have a profiling shape. Uh, so we're going to, in this case, we used the peak hour as one. We normalized everything to that. And depending on your customer class, before the peak hour, uh, a load will be profiled maybe a little less than one. Or depending on your customer class, it might be a little more than one. Whatever the profile is, we just sum up the load shape and we, 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 we scale it based on this gross peak hour. So we take a single number. We break it into customer classes, and then we multiply the customer class by this profile. So, for example, uh, LSC1 starts with 15,000. 
Uh, we normalize it, it stays at 15,000 during the peak, but that same uh, uh, LSE is multiplied by these shaping factors by each one of its classes and then summed up. So its load for LSE one in hour one is eight 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 zero and so on. So we're, we're able to transform to 24 hours by just collecting a single hour data point. And we do that with everybody. And this is what this winds up looking like, the top graph. This is the ISO's total shape. We've taken that single peak number from these guys, which is a one, and we've used load shapes based on the people that are in their customer bases. And LSC one is the green. It would have this shape before we do sort of a final true up based on that normalization. So we took one data point and converted it into 24. Now you can observe here that although we normalize to one in hour 18, so it fits perfectly, most of the other hours don't. Some are overshooting, some are undershooting. So we propose there'd be one additional step where we'd sort of look at the ratio of the actual demand and the unadjusted demand, and we'd, we'd scale all of these all of these LSEs by sort of this, this ratio so that the sum winds up uh, equaling the, the actual load. So, so we do a little adjustment to everybody. It's kind of pro rata based on the error in that hour and their, their load in that hour, profile load. And after we do this little true up adjustment, you can see that our bottom lines here match the top line here. And graphically, we perfectly match the shape and LSC one's 24 hour profile is shown in green. Uh, we've stacked them here so they add up, but each person would just be responsible for their own 24 hour profile. And that would be the starting point for their RA requirement. We've now determined what their load requirement is. We would then in our model add a planning reserve margin on top of that, and they'd have to show for all 24 hours based on this profile. Okay, uh, Brent, again, I'll pause if, uh, Anything you want to add at this point? Yeah, and so there's there's quite a bit on on the, the chat about coincidence and um, but like custom low, low shapes. So so I just want to point out, SE is not saying this is the only way. We kind of laid out there's you know everyone takes a, a fixed shape. Don't think that's a, a great idea. Custom shapes by LSE with negotiations at the, with the CEC. That that might be workable. It looks like we're going to have a presentation from the CEC later today, and I'd like to hear from from them there. Uh, just want to throw out this as as a possible alternative. You know, m maybe there's the trade-offs of doing this are are you know, you know, no one sees. You know, we we we're not seeing enough benefit of the simplification, um, but uh, you know, just wanted to to put this out there as as an option going forward. Yeah, if we think custom load shapes is administratively doable, we, we you know, it's, I, I don't object. Uh, but we really need to talk through to make sure that it is administratively doable. Yeah. And, and, and some of the concepts here of of the hour by hour um, normalization uh, it, it will will be important no matter what method is used to make sure that that the you know individual you know shaped LSE loads do match up to the, the totals. Right, and if I didn't emphasize, it's each customer class will have its own own shape, you know, based on the data, it's actual data. CC can figure out what that shape looks like. We're not sure how many classes we should have. Uh, that, that would be based on the data that's available to both ends, the CEC and the LSA. Uh, so again, we're trying, we're shooting for reasonable, not perfect and administratively doable. And something that's fair. Not perfect, but fair. OK, so what we'd have to do here, we'd have to work with the CEC and the LSEs to see you know, what data what data makes sense to use. How many classes can we really break down from both sides? And what makes sense? What makes sense? Um, and again, we have to make sure that the LSEs are capable of, if we decide it's going to be four classes, these are them, that the LSEs are capable of decomposing the gross peak into those four classes, and they're comfortable doing that. OK, so that's it for the presentation. So I think we have, I tried to speed through. Uh, I think we got uh, almost 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, uh, 
let's go uh, do that. So first I have Kathleen Colbert. Great, thanks. Um, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Uh, thanks so much, Jeff. Really appreciate it. And thanks, Brent. Um, this is interesting. Um, has a lot to think about. I, um, I had a kind of a more basic question. If you don't mind going back to, I think it's slide seven or eight. It's on the um, custom, I think the custom LC shape. Uh, go back one more. Uh, yeah, thank you. Option two. Farther back than I thought. Um, I jumped in the queue real quick. Uh, so <laughs> um, I just had a question here on the bottoms up approach and cons, because one of the things that has been niggling at, at me um, that I've been struggling with, and I'd be curious to hear your thinking on this, is that one of the main cons of this kind of approach is it doesn't account for the diversity benefits associated with joining an ISO or RTO. Um, and that if we were to take all these custom LC shapes for a given hour under your 24 hour proposal and sum it all up, it could, ex it, there are periods that would exceed what is required from a system basis. And I just have been struggling with whether that is, you know, fair and, and just for as a whole, the system to be over procuring relative to the system need if you were to take this approach. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about that and your thoughts on it. So, so maybe I'll go and it, it, we kind of address this in, in our example. It's not laid out here, but that that uh, that adjustment, that hour by hour adjustment for the LSE requirements or the forecast, I think would have to be done to make sure that, that, that everything scales to the actual system, the expected system need in, in that hour. So that kind of final check to make sure that, you know, yeah, the, the hour 99 is maybe a good example where if you do just a basic approach, you, you might end up with the, the total need in that hour being higher, the, the, the total LSE by LSE need be higher than the actual crisis system need. And so th that should be adjusted down. Okay, that's really helpful. Yeah, I missed that. Um, can you confirm that that would be your thinking for both option B and option C, the kind of the compromise? Yeah, well, I think so any aside from the top down version, which uses that shape for everyone, yep. any other method would, would need a, a process to do that. Yeah. OK, no, I really appreciate it. Um, that's my thinking, too. I would just um, appreciate talking through it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next up is Barbara Barkovich. Hi, I'll be brief because Jeff has already mentioned the one and a half of my concern. Commercial and industrial customers are on the same rate schedules and they often have different load shapes. Furthermore, at least for Edison, food processors are on agricultural load shapes and they, between them, have different load, uh, load profiles. So I think if you try to do it on a class basis, the data are not going to be um, fully available for what it's worth. Thanks. Yeah, and that, that's a that's a, a really a, a threshold question. Is the data here to do this on both sides, the CEC and the LSAs? So we would like to explore that a little more. Uh, that is a threshold question. If we can't get past that, I, I agree. This this methodology has is unworkable. Thanks. Uh, next, I have Doug Carpa. Doug, you also had questions for Calwia. Do you want to ask to SE now, or would you like to do both of your questions later on? OK, I think that's uh, that he'll pass <laughs> to later on. Hang on, uh, hang on. I'm just trying to get myself off mute here. Ah, OK, go on. Yeah, no, for SCE, and I can take up the Calwia stuff later. Um, one of the one of the issues with the option three that I think it is going to fall short on avoiding cross subsidization is that the biggest driver uh, is weather rather than customer classes. So this time from Peninsula Clean Energy, so that's San Mateo County. We are winter peaking, and so if we are you know decomposing this into a bunch of customer classes, but each of those customer classes are reflecting statewide load, we're going to end up basically having to procure energy for our own customers load, which is one shape and then a completely different thing for matching the statewide load. So I'm wondering whether there might be something um, like incorporating weather or geographical variation, which is largely weather driven, like coastal versus interior or something like that, um, as another either another decomposition layer or just simply using the 
the custom option two approach. So, and maybe I'll hit that one as well. So yeah, so we have the the bookends. We have full custom. You know, maybe this is somewhere in the middle. There's also there's degradations all, all between, right? So so having regional, it seems like that's really close to the custom shapes though. And and yeah, you know, maybe we'll, we'll we'll hear later whether that whether whether you know parties think that's that's feasible. But um, yeah, I, there there's different versions. This is just maybe a a middle ground. As we have heard, maybe it's not fully feasible, at least within SE. We're fairly confident that we have this type of information or could create it if if we need to. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it might not reflect all locations, might not even be feasible given uh, other folks' data systems. Yeah, my, my big concern is it wouldn't capture the biggest component of the variation between LSEs. That we could do this and like, it, it, it leaves the biggest problem still unsolved. But I can put together a proposal sort of leveraging on what you've done and you know, maybe um, that will be useful. So great. Thank, sure. you. Thank you. Yeah, we did we had did talk about if we were doing this on TAC, it might look a little differently. But if it's coastal versus inland, I don't think you're gonna capture that in, in sort of a TAC basis. So that would imply that if there was another dimension of the data, you know, how much of this stuff was coastal versus inland. There might be there might be different shapes for coastal residential versus inland residential. Uh, yeah, at some point, I just don't know if the data is there and the ability to decompose it is there. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. Yeah, and, and there's another way of slicing the data we didn't show here. We might be able to slice it based on uh, size of customers uh, uh, and, and using rate schedules that are differentiated by sizes. We, that might be another way of slicing the data. But again, that may not get the weather variation that you're concerned about. And, and I, I understand that concern. It's a, it's a question of, is there a reasonable answer that works for everyone? OK, let's move on to Noah Tang. Hi, uh, Noah Tang from uh, um, Middle River Power. Uh, just two questions. One mainly is a follow up to what uh, you and Doug have been sort of talking about. I'm wondering um, in this uh, sort of individual LSE or semi-custom load, are you, are you asking for the worst uh, day for each individual LSE rather versus a, a specific worst day that the CEC forecasted? It's a, it's a good question. I, so I'm going to say the, um, the, the overall, the final step of like double checking is going to be based on the CEC's 24-hour worst day. Um, now, what is asked of the LSCs? I, I, th I think it would be related to that day, um, but I'm not exactly sure. Jeff, you, you, you want to? Yeah, that 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 gets down to: Are we picking a single day and asking everyone for what do they look like on that day? I don't know if they have that data. I think most people have the data. Like, what does my worst day look like? Uh, I'm not sure. Again, uh, there's always exceptions, but I'm not sure it's going to matter that much. I'm not sure how many people have a worse day that is different, non-coincident with the worst day in the in the grid, and how different those numbers would be if I asked for their personal worst day versus their coincident worst day. I'm just not sure how material that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, it sounds, sorry. It, I mean, it sounds like Doug keeps saying that he has a much worse different worst day than other folks on that are inland. Um, so that those are something uh, something that I was uh, considering. Also a question on the the 24 hour load that uh, are you then uh, sort of explicitly stating that each LSC will have 24 requirements um, on a seasonal monthly basis and the ISO would validate 24 requirements as part of the uh, RA framework. OK, so so Yes, to a point. Yes, each LSC will just in this model, they'll submit a single point for the month, the gross load decomposed by class. They will get handed back using the shaping factor for the CEC, a 24 hour profile. They will be required to use that 24 hour profile for their CPUC showings. It's my understanding at this stage, the ISO doesn't want to change any of their systems, so the ISO is not going to be doing a 24-hour check at this stage. The CPUC will. 
Okay, so uh, there will be some dis sort of a little disconnect between what the ISO is checking, which is only one uh, one slice, if you will, um, versus what the CPC is doing on a looking at a more uh, holistic 24 hours basis. My, unless the ISO changes their mind, that's my understanding how this would work out of the gates. Frankly, I think it's inevitable that the ISO is going to have to change its processes. It's just a question of when. Got it. Thanks so much. Excellent. Um, with that, we have reached the 30 minute mark. I've noted uh, Nick, Darius, and Sue. Sue Mary, you had raised your hand several times, but also lowered it. I, I uh, noted you in the in the list for the Q&A, so uh, let's get to that after the next one. Thank you very much, Jeff. Hey, thank you guys very much. Uh, good questions. Thank you. So next up, we'll have a presentation by the CEC. Um, same for uh, to respect uh, the 30 minutes uh, you'll have until 1142 uh, to cover that. All right, and I think my presentation is coming up. So, so hi, uh, this is Lynn Marshall, California Energy Commission staff. So I wanted to talk about um, sort of the load, our load forecast perspective on um, how these different slice proposals would affect the, our, the load forecast process and how that might work. So I'll just go through first how the current process works and what the, the sort of high level implications are for changes we'd need to make. So the, the first starting point has been discussed. We, we need a forecast for the IOU service area. So we start with our IPER um, TAC area forecast. We already have an 8760 TAC area forecast. So the CAISO monthly peak day drives that forecast, drives the RA forecast. Right now, we're only disaggregating that coincident peak hour. So in the, um, in the under these alternative versions, we'd have to have an hourly disaggregation, either, you know, the peak day or, or you know, whatever time period is needed. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, then next, we have LSE submitting their non-coincident monthly peak forecast and we're estimating the KISO coincident peak. Under some version where there's no energy sufficiency check and there's just maybe a peak and a net peak, that's very minimal changes. We could do that pretty easily. But when you once you add an energy sufficiency tech, check, yes, we do need some degree of hourly. Could be 8760. There's a lot of advantages to that in, in terms of um, giving a lot of visibility on individual LSE's forecasts and I would just you know following on some of the previous comments there I I think um, if you haven't had the opportunity to look at the all the individual LSE historic loads that I have had over the year probably don't appreciate how much real heterogeneity there is among LSE's both because of latitude longitude other aspects of climate zone different um, industrial customer customer mixes um a lot of variation and somebody's say okay um so but an alternative could be just having lses provide a 24 is it not a i don't know it's my screen i can see it Okay, it's there. Um, yes, we can see your screen and please everyone else, uh, please remember to mute yourselves if you're on okay. the phone or on the app. Okay, so yeah, a simpler version might be having LSEs provide a 24 hour forecast for their peak day. Uh, come back to that point. Um, under that scenario, we're going to rely more on historic data, which is um, anyway, currently a uh, key input for us in evaluating the reasonableness of forecasts. Um, then next we're developing, we have a process, we're setting a benchmark for kind of um, 
evaluating the reasonableness of LSE forecast. So under the monthly peak paradigm, we do uh, weather adjusted monthly peaks, for example, or use DASR activity to estimate what their load should be. And that's pretty, it's not simple, but you know that, that's a straightforward methodology and we um, works reasonably well. We get to 24 hours, then you know obviously we need to ha have a more um, complex analysis to decide what the right benchmarks are. And then um, there are some incremental adjustments for demand side programs that shouldn't be a big obstacle for most of those. There's already an hourly underlying hourly forecast. And then finally, if we check to make sure that those adjusted forecasts sum to within 1% of the CEC reference forecast, that's step number one, and then apply a pro rata if it doesn't, right? And so the idea of do, getting two and three to uh, adjust LSE's forecasts ac ac um, appropriately is you have very minimal pro rata adjustments. So then you have a, feel comfortable you have a, reasonably fair cost allocation. Um, going back to the, our, our service area reference forecast. So the w way we develop our hourly tack area peaks, we're using an hourly load model, kind of in a statistical Monte Carlo simulation, basically weather normalizing the last three years of TAC loads. Um, to generate those 8760 forecasts. We are uh, hoping and planning to attempt to run that for the IOU service area in 2022 and see if we can downscale all the data we need and get reasonable results. You know, conceptually, we could run it for the TAC and then for the jurisdictional loads and then for the non jurisdictional and see if those stack up reasonably well. Um, but that'll be kind of a experimental work next year, but that could provide a good basis for the new framework. Um, so moving on to the LSE specific coincidence adjustments. So part of the current process is that when LSEs submit non-coincident monthly peaks, that is actually an important info, input for the CRR process. We have same process for public utilities as well. So you would still need to have um, monthly LSE non-coincident peaks in the say 24 slice um, framework. It would need to have, we'd need to have LSE submit uh, say 24 hour forecast for their peak day, uh, not the peak day of the system because if we don't want LSEs determining their own coincidence adjustment, right? That's CEC does that. Um, so we're doing that on kind of a statistically fair basis. So the way we do the currently do coincidence adjustment, it is based on the LSE's own actual recorded loads, right? And that was a decision made in the RA proceeding quite a few years ago, because when we started off, we had kind of an average coincidence factor across, I think, within attack, And it was very apparent just from looking at the data that those were res really resulting in unfair cost allocations because there is so much uh, variation in load shape and coincidence patterns. And that really provides an incentive to the LSEs to manage their load shape. Um, Given the direction we're going now, that is more important than ever. LSEs have all kinds of opportunities to either build load through, you know, transportation electrification um, or reduce load through, you know, DERs. Um, but we want to have them in, in a, make sure they have an incentive as they're, you know, promoting electrification in their service area that they're also managing the load. Uh, the impacts of that load on um, on the system on the high stress hours, right? So when you start to um, use kind of standardized load shapes, it really uh, kind of waters down that incentive. So moving to doing coincidence an hour coincidence for a 24 hour slice, that's 
that's totally feasible. It's just more statistics. Um, one concern I do have is, you know, we're forecasting based on CAISO EMS data. It's at generation, um, whereas LSEs are starting with your your settlement loads. And it, I can stack those data up um, and compare it to the CAISO level. And it's usually the the EMS data. It's on peak hours, two to three percent higher. So that's that's good transmission losses. Um, on the ramping periods, the difference is, is much greater. So there's that inconsistency in, in just measurement hasn't been a big problem for this peak focus, but it could present some complications in a 24-hour framework. Um, let's see. Another question, another thing to think about, and it's, you know, a lot of these things don't have to be resolved now as we're moving, just choosing a direction, but we do base the coinc the peak coincidence on recorded data, but when you think about um, hourly energy buckets, it seems to me there should be more consideration given to changes in the load shape, and one of the advantages of having LSE submit their own, you know, hourly load is they can reflect what load various load modifying activities they have in their forecast. And not all LSEs do that. Um, but for those that are pursuing those types of programs, you know, they want to be able to show that and plan accordingly. So the going to on to how we set a benchmark for evaluating LSE forecasts. We would obviously have to, you know, set up some new um, statistical analysis to do that. One uh, avenue we could explore is taking something like our hourly load model and trying to run it for um, specific LSEs that would probably work well for um, LSEs that have had a fairly stable footprint over several years. But, you know, there are methodologies out there for weather normalizing hourly loads, and that is a big part of the effect, and it does vary tremendously um, throughout the state based on, you know, latitude, longitude, and everything else. So I, I think it's, you know, some work there for us, but I think that's, um, you know, that seems like a manageable problem. Um, the idea of, you know, the, the Edison proposal, you're trying to simplify things by having CEC go develop load profiles. Well, that's more, you know, that, that sounds like a more complicated process. It's more work over there. So um, in, in my view, the best estimate of an LSE's hourly loads next year is our hourly loads last year, plus some adjustment for weather normalization and load migration. You know, we already have interval data, data on all, all our almost all customers, so why not just start with that, the uh, low data for the customers you have. Um, another consideration, I think, I touched on this a little bit, is accounting for load modifiers. And if you're standardizing on load shapes, load profiles, I don't see how that, that gets accounted for. Um, and it can vary tremendously by LSE. So we we do expect as we add, start adding more um, electrification, fuel substitution to our forecast that um, tack area load shape is going to evolve. So we want to have a process, if we go, especially in a multi-year framework, where the LSEs can that are engaged in those activities can follow a parallel path. So those are my thoughts. Um, final concerns, really have to think about the schedule. Uh, obviously, it's a very tight time frame for us as it is. Um, one thought would be to try to do a dry run sometime next year that could let us test out uh, you know what metrics we're going to use to do, to evaluate the forecast and um, see what kind of results we get 
um, using LSEs submitting the same forecast in the new framework that they would submit be submitting anyway for 2023. So we could have a side by side comparison. Um, and one thing that would be really helpful for us, um, either in your informal comments or you can reach out to, to me, is what our LSE's perspective on how difficult it is to do hourly forecasts. Um, maybe you have methodologies in place to generate an 8760, or some LSEs might just be using their historic loads. I think for some ESPs, that's not actually not that inaccurate. So any thoughts from LSEs on, on uh, how you see this working or what, what other pitfalls are maybe would be helpful to me? And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I, I think I have first Nick Pappas. Hey, thanks, Sergio. Yeah, I think I dropped out of the queue and back in. Uh, Lynn, this is really helpful. Uh, sorry, Nick Pappas here on behalf of Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, this is really helpful to learn more about the process of someone who's not spent a ton of time in, in IPER world. Um, so two thoughts. One is around this idea of sort of dry run. I think that's a really good idea, probably not just for the load forecasting, but probably for this, this whole slice of day exercise, I think would probably be very beneficial. Um, and then it, this, this sort of ties this presentation and the Edison presentation together, but I think this notion of, you know, our, our end goal seems like we're all generally aligned that LSE specific profiles are the right end goal but it may need to be part of a sort of phased um, implementation where perhaps the first phase, let's say 24 or 25, is system system level load ratio share, and then maybe in the second phase, you could transition to kind of LSE specific, uh, given just the broader complexity of all of the changes that are happening here with Slice of Day. So curious to hear your, your take on if that would be more aligned with kind of a timeline where you think this could be more implementable from the CEC perspective. Well, we already do um, LSE specific, you know, coincident peak, you know, peak forecast determination. So I see no reason to go back to, you know, some kind of uh, more peanut butter approach. Um, the off peak hours will be more challenging, but then as some people have said, well, those are not critical periods right now. So actually starting to do this now um, when maybe if, uh, things aren't as um, tuned up as they could be and you know some of the off peak hours well it won't, may not have many much financial consequences at this point i'd rather start implementing that sooner so we can uh, see how well various metrics works or whether or you know what methodological changes we need to do great thank you okay next up we have doug carpa Hey, Lynn, uh, Doug Carpa, Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, probably a big vote of confidence for you all that we're all like, yeah, we'll just have the Energy Commission do it because they're good at this stuff. Um, <laughs> clearly, we all trust you to, to do it do it well. Um, I guess kind of clarifying a little bit for myself, your take home message here. If I understand right, then the doing the kind of custom load profiles for the all the off peak, so for all 24 hours for off peak, um, would use a lot of the same data. It's basically just some additional analysis that would need to be done. It's not um, hugely more, more complicated than what you're doing now. Am I understanding that right? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, we there. I mean, we're, we have a modeling framework for for developing a you know normalized 8760. I'm sure other people do too, right? Those types of you know actually some of the utilities participated in the process helping us to develop that framework. So um, it's been pretty well discussed. So I think we could really explore downscaling. It may have to be simplified in some ways. There could be challenges in terms of, well, what weather stations do we need to use if we're looking at it? In a year ahead framework, deltas of, of like additional PV installations aren't as significant as in the IPER, you know, 10 year forecast. Um, but I, I do think that's something we can explore. Mm -hmm. And you know it would work better for a CCA that's been around for a few years. Um, 
not sure it would work well for some ESPs or for new CCAs, but I think you could cover a lot of ground with that type approach. Very cool. Um, the other, I think it's probably more of a comment, but I really wanted to um, emphasize the critical nature of capturing load modification, like having a methodology that would capture load modification. A peninsula clean energy in particular, we do, um, we're pretty aggressive about particularly using behind the meter storage to shape our loads. Um, and so like our ability, our contributions to reliability are both behind and in front of the meter. Um, and particularly because we're trying to get to using renewables in all 24 hours or 87, 60 hours in the year. Um, that's really, really critical, particularly from a cost perspective, because I think there's a lot of the modeling results that have looked at the impact of load modification find that um, a combined approach of using load modification and um, generation, you know, procuring generation, it's just more cost effective than trying to do it entirely with building out generation resources. Um, and as individual LLCs are more or less aggressive, it is pretty important that those actions not be just sort of spread peanut buttered across everybody, but that each LLC essentially gets credit for the work that they are doing um, in the RA space, which, you know, some of the proposals wouldn't be able to do that as, as you pointed out. So I really want to thank you for raising that point. That's that hits home for, for us. OK, uh, I don't see other questions in the queue. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please raise your hands. Um, if not, I'll move to the uh, queue that we had prior for all the other presentations as well. So I'll give I'll give people uh, some time <laughs> to to queue up if needed before I go uh, to the previous line. Okay, I see Doug again. Uh, do you have another question for for Lynn, Doug? Doug? Okay. Oh no, no, I thought I was jumping in for the um, bugging Darius about stuff. Oh yeah, I, I've written those names down. Don't worry. So oh, let's start okay. um, questions for Kawia again. Uh, then uh, let's start with uh, Noah Tang, please. Hi, uh, Darius. This is uh, Noah. From Middle River Power. Power. I'm just, just, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, I do. I can hear you. Yes. Great. Great. Um, um, I'm here on the I'm not sure if anyone else is. Okay. Um, so, um, my question is whether or not you thought about with the uh, NLR approach uh, for the QC methodology, um, whether or not how it would be different relative to the different slices and seasons um, sort of where we've been talking about, you know, Gridwell has its uh, seasonal um, and two slices. Um, pg and &E, I think has six slices and then Edison has the 24. How those values may differ um, amongst, the, amongst the three different types of uh, frameworks. Uh, a very good question um, to to not not to um, to to be outside um, from this slice um, person, um, th th basically prescribing number of slices we have uh, we also have had, had advocated for three slices um, per season um, three seasons and three slices per season more or less. And, and and of course, um, what we discovered is is of course the, the wider the slice, the the bigger the requirement will be. If 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 the critical slice becomes one of these, what we had was you know a twelve hour slice, a three hour slice, another I don't know nine hour slice or something. With with three hour slice corresponding to to time of the critical need. And and then these longer slices to simply make sure that there is enough enough energy um, capacity and energy for during those slices as well. But basically, 
we know the 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 critical slices that three hour slice where all the major ra purchases sales and purchases will take place the other slices will will have a lesser of an impact uh, of lesser importance and but however um i think peter uh, uh, from griffith from pg&e at least convinced me that uh if if we have slices of different durations or we have very long slices if the critical time period critical um um slice or critical need falls into a 12 hour slice we will be probably over procuring we will be back into the same trap we are today in which uh we the slice we have is 24 hours and um in fact it's more than 25 hours, 720 hours and we pick well one hour within that and then we we have all this capacity needed for the entire duration for no reason so um so I, I think the we 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 we, are, we we believe we came to the wisdom that having these slices not to be too wide may not be a bad idea. So that if for in the future the critical um, capacity requirement uh, moves from say slice number four in summer season to a slice number two in winter season for example that we we don't have to all of a sudden have a 12-hour slice to procure uh, to deal with that critical capacity now let's talk about the to four-hour slice because i i think that makes most sense in, in order to have the stability of of this framework in for transactability and stability of this framework during the four hour slice if it say it applies to um uh, four seasons so um approximately 120 days and we have four hours in the slice so that slice covers 480 hours now it all depends um what we do for determining system need during that 480 hours that applies to that slice number four for summer season um and if if pg e has been advocating pick the the worst hour the the hour of that slice where the net peak uh, net load is the maximum and that would be we we more or less forget about um, the four hundred and um, seventy nine hours. We only focus on that one hour. We make sure that we can cover that one hour. And be, because this slice is carefully selected, in which various behave more or less the same way, we know storage has 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 kept its uh, has kept its. Uh, charge and is ready to behave, function, and 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 so on. So these since these slices are, are are carefully selected. The fact that we're only focusing on one hour in this 480 hours may not be the end of the in, in end of the world. It's not like the framework we have today. We have we pick one hour in seven in for the whole 720 days, and each hours in it, and and the system behavior changes during every hour of the 72 hours more or less here is each slice has every 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 element of the system behaves more or less the same way so if we focus on that then um then it becomes a, a, a matter of how do you, do you um go from this nlr factor not net load reduction factors for wind and solar to the effective capacity or qualifying capacity for that slice. We have uh, in our presentation, we, we have mentioned um, one approach, which seems to be most logical, is to calculate the NLR factors for 
each one of the hours, each one of the 480 hours, and average it. And that will be the qualifying capacity for that slice. And you can, the, the wind and solar resource for that slice keeps that QC and goes forward. You can transact around it and as much as you want. And maybe in after several years, that, that number changes a little bit. But that that is that is what we have said. But people may want to say rather than taking the average of of all the 480 hours, we take the average of that one hour for the the 120 days. Uh, that that hour is critical. Take that critical hour and take the average of, or maybe. Um, uh, Another fa another calculation around. Hitter, hitter. Um, um, let me let me yeah, ask the question. question. So in your in mind, your mind and the NLR, NLR equal or how it creates a, a one singular one NQC singular. value for um, the month or separate NQC values based on the hour, uh, the diff based on the different slices because they would have different NLR percentages. Sir, you're on mute. Uh, there is you. You are muted. Uh, I, I guess you mute me in order to prevent the echo, and I'm not sure where the echo comes from. Um, uh, so, um, so no. Each each slice will have its own NLR QC. Um, it will have which is the average of NLR factors that belong to the hours, say 480 hours we talked about, of, of slice number four for the summer, for the month, four month of summer, June, July, August, yeah. September. So uh, that, that is, and that, that NLR based QC is, will be, belong to that type of resource for that slice for the foreseeable future. So it's it's a fixed number. You get it, you keep it the same way you keep you can you get your ELCC number and it belongs to that resource, or you get your exceedance number that belongs to that resource. It will be exactly that. But if the framework is basically based on PGE's proposal, which we have supported, the framework changes. To these slices, so for each, so we focus on one slice for the whole summer season, say slice number four, and slice number four being the most critical one, and we 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 propose that for the 480 hours we calculate NLR factors for wind and solar for every hour, and average it for the to calculate the QC NLR based QC for for that slice. And, and wind and solar get that number and they can keep that number and they can transact around that number. And, and we, we just say that QC that's calculated in this fashion is more rational um, and, and better reflects the correlation between um, um, load and wind production or load and solar production. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, uh, for that, thanks for that, Mr. Virsh. Next up, we have Nick Pappas, uh, also for questions for Kauia. Hey, thanks, Sergio, and thanks, Daryush. Uh, so, Daryush, I really appreciate your presentation, and I, I think I'm with you on just about all the kind of problem statements and kind of framing the challenge. I think what I'm what I'm trying to wrap my head around is, as some folks have mentioned in the chat, I, this does feel very conceptually similar to an exceedance method just using a median or average exceedance. And I think maybe the nuance uh, is there's an attempt here to tie it to the toughest hour, which I think is getting at sort of the correlation presentation that PG&E and, and the solar parties put together or, or possibly the kind of worst day construct. But I, I think maybe you can help talk us through this, but I, I does feel a lot like an exceedance methodology. So if you can help us walk through the differences, I think that would be, be helpful. Sure, sure. So in exceedance methodology, you look at only wind production, for example. Um, say you want to calculate exceedance based 
qualifying capacity for wind. And you only look at wind output. And and then you you see you and you suppose you're only looking our number 18, whatever. Um, then you're looking at wind output only at wind output, and you 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 calculate an a seventy percent exceedance based on wind only output. You don't look at the the load at that, and whether a particular wind output that you pick among you have um, hundred say you have a slice with uh, one hundred and twenty days that covers one hundred and twenty days. That one hour you'll have one hundred and twenty. Uh, slices. Now, um, you have 120 slices, and you pick the 70% exceedance using 120 slices for that hour. Now, in that respect, you don't see whether each one of those samples, how they they coincided with the load. In other words, you, 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 the sample, any every sample counts in your calculation. Uh, and, and and that way you pick the thirty percent and seventy percent or whatever number you you pick. Um, but you don't see whether each one of those samples how they impact load. The difference between that and what we're suggesting here is we first find out we match every hour load with every hour wind, and then take the difference, and then we have a sample of one hundred and twenty of these. Now, if you want to apply exceedance to this difference, which actually shows how every sample impacted the load for for the day that it applied, then then that may be an approach you may want to use. In other words, take the NLRs, calculate net load impact, net load, a net load reduction factor, and then rather than averaging it. Um, or taking a median, take the seventy percent exceedance based on. So, if 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 you want to apply exceedance to NLR factors, maybe that's one way of being conservative or something. But the numbers are not. The approach is different in the sense that we every wind production, wind output hour, with output amount sample. Is first netted against the load at the in the day at the time exact time where that wind production was done. So if it was the wind production was very high, and and load was very low, that wind wind is actually not a very good. So it, we will we capture that using this NLR. We then advocate that once now that we have captured this correlation perfectly, let's use the average number as opposed to use exceedance, which is intended to say, well, I did not capture whether this high wind corresponded to a day which high load, so really was valuable to me as opposed to useless. But here we first make sure that the, the impact is calculated. Now it, uh, using an average number may not be a bad idea as opposed to having to go to 70% exceedance to capture the fact that you know, you had a day of high wind and low low, so it was useless. The wind was useless that that day. We we, we won't allow that wind to count um, uh, in that fashion. So we, we bring load into the equation. So if, if anything, this is a poor man's ELCC as opposed to a, a an advanced exceedance. It's a poor man's ELCC because every production is measured against the need, the same way ELCC does it, but LCC does it in a very fancy fashion and very complex fashion. It's very simple. Every every sample production is measured against wind to see that if, if it's useful or not before it, it comes into the equation. Hey, Darish, thanks. Thanks for that. And I, I think I, I'd love to talk offline because I still think it's it's a very similar approach, maybe just with subsetting on load instead of exceedance, but let's let's connect offline and talk more about the potential similarities here. Sure, sure. OK, um, next up, and I'll cue you both uh, so that hopefully we can split like five and five minutes. It's Doc Carpa and Matthew Barmick. Yeah, actually, um, 
I'm trying to wrap my head around a lot of the same stuff as Nick, so I think maybe I'll seed my time and just ask Nick, can you include me in that conversation? Because I, I think I'm still trying to wrap my head around the mathematics of how this is actually done. Um, so that's all I have to say. I do agree that, you know, with your comments about the uh, existing methodology, particularly like using ELCC and trying to import ELCC, which is a global value into hourly formats, like doesn't make any sense at all. But that's another that's another conversation. Anyway, so let, maybe I'll pick it back with you, Nick, if that's okay. Excellent. Um, Matthew Barmick? Yeah, hey, this is Matt Barmack from Calpine, and I can give everybody back some extra lunch time because, you know, I had exactly the same question as Nick uh, and Doug, and, and something is just not adding up. Dariush, I, I think what what you're what you're calling a resources contribution to net load, um, as I understand it, is just its its output. Um, so I, I think I'm missing something fundamental. And and if you if you do follow up with Nick or provide a a, a more extensive um, example along the lines that I think Bridget just recommended. I'd really appreciate that. Let me note that uh, under sim more simpler si circumstances, your um, statement is accurate, that the contribution is, is uh, the output for a particular hour of a, of a slice. Uh, the contribution is the output, the total output. But when it comes to more nuanced um, calculation, uh, calculation based on zone, based on technology. It, it may be a bit different, uh, and the nonlinear linear impact of um, netting against load may make a difference, uh, especially that load in different samples are, is going to be different, and 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 the generation during every sample is going to be different. If load was the same, it will be exactly this the output would be exactly the same the the um, the exceedance versus the the approach would be the same if if load was the same during the entire 480 samples or if we were focusing on one hour during the entire 120 samples for the four month of summer but since load is changing the impact is nonlinear, and so there, there are nuances here which are uh, important to um, important in our calculation, and that's why we 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 wanted to focus on the net load impact as opposed to just net generation, it, the output of the of, of the resource. Okay, um, let's move on to the leftover questions for SEE. I have two, uh, one from Nick Pappas and one from Dariush. Hey, thanks. I think my dog is just about to bark about going outside, so apologies if that happens. Uh, Nick Pappas again on behalf of NRDC. Uh, Jeff and Brent, really appreciate you all teasing out a lot of, you know, a, a candid assessment of what is admittedly a very complex problem. Not that we shouldn't pursue it, but it is certainly challenging. Um, my, my question is, is actually related to what I asked uh, Lynn earlier from the CEC is, you know, if, if our end goal is to try to move towards LSE load shapes, I think that was option two, it, rather than kind of creating a new complex structure like option three, which I think is a very creative, but would, would be very administratively burdensome if it's a kind of medium state. What, what are your thoughts on maybe starting with option one and having some sort of transitional pathway to option two? once uh, stakeholders have some more experience and, and the commission, both commissions have more experience with slice of day implementation. Have you given that any thought or do you have any, any perspective on a potential kind of transitional plan? Well, this is really dangerous because I haven't discussed it with anyone. Uh, I, I do think a transition the concept makes sense. I don't like our option one. It's too brute. Uh, if I was going to do some transition, another thing I've thought about that I haven't discussed anyone's have four different generic load shapes, and you just pick the one that looks closest to you, uh, and uh, transition to something more accurate from there. 
I don't know how many generic, but just a handful of generic load tubes. Thank you. I don't know about Brent. I haven't, I haven't told that to anybody until now. So. <laughs> and you're on mute. Maybe that's from purpose. Maybe maybe you don't want her to hear. I, I'm not on mute. I just had to move my mic to, to my face. <laughs> I, so, so, so I don't disagree, Jeff. Uh, so assuming that, that, that the other bookend fully custom shapes can't be ready for go live, yeah, maybe that that's a the interim easy path of of have a few, you know, generic load shapes for each month, and you just you know pick pick one. Um, it sounds like potentially that the the full custom could be ready for for go live. Anyway, so Nick, I think that covers your question. Who's who's next? Okay, next we have Dariush. So uh, I must say that. Um, I'm not a, a I'm not, not very knowledgeable about load. Um, I'm more into resources, but I've always felt that this this slice of day will have the effect of capturing people's load profile very easy, comfortably when it comes to determining their obligation to to buy. Uh, um, RA, re, RA capacity in this new paradigm, in this new framework. Um, for example, if a, a, a particular LSC is the one that's peaking during, say, 8 a.m. On, on winter, um, and its load is very low during um, the, the critical slice, slice number four um, summer season, we will see that it's RA shortfall for the slice that is most expensive, well, RA capacity will be most expensive, which is slice number four for summer season. That what, particular- What is, what is slice number four? I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just assuming the, the, that's the one that happens, say, between uh, 6 to 10 p.m. on, um, on maybe slice number five, but it's one of the slice with the. Um, I'm assuming that's the slice with the critical system need, the 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 one in during for which the capacity price is the the RA capacity price will be the highest. People will be buying in in this new framework of slice of day, rather than pay, buying one RA number for the month as we they do now. They will be buying our ape in 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 for each slice in this new framework. So, the, if there is one slice that would be the the RA capacity would be most valuable, would be slice number four or five for the summer season, the one that corresponds to six to ten p.m. on at during during summer, uh, in various presentation that. So we don't we don't envision trading slices separately. Yeah. We, we don't envision that working at all that way that you're trading slices that we you buy an entire unit for the entire output capability so i'm not following even your hypothetical and and, and stepping back the, the the your the hypothetical at least a piece of it was that you had a, a utility that's winter peaking today under the, the current ra framework they would have the, their highest requirements in december Right. Yes. Uh, because of uh, to, to even today and, and in the future world, we expect their their highest requirement, you know, month to be December still or wherever January, whatever the size, whatever that that peak month is. Um, so yeah, they, but 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 go back to what Jeff said. Yeah, we so we don't envision slice by slice trading. We're gonna have, you know slice by slice requirements right so you know so we're proposing 24 slices each 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 hour effectively has its own ra requirement and if we were to buy or if an lse was to buy a wind uh, uh, ra from a wind facility they'd be buying a portion of the wind facility 100 percent 50 percent some some portion of it and if it's a 100 megawatt facility then you get 100 megawatts you know shaped across the across the entire 24 okay. hours of, of the day I, I'm I'm actually I'm puzzled by that answer because I I thought the main reason for having these slices is so that each slice will have its own trading. No, absolutely not, absolutely not. 
Yeah, so, so the, the, the main reason well, for it, slices it is... It's it, fun for your slices, which are the, too many of them. You have to... Uh, they're not too many. It's precisely right. Is, Anything else creates big inaccuracies. So, yeah, so our, so our I, the, proposal is right. The main benefit of, of slices is to is to get rid of like the daily based MCC buckets and ensure that there's enough capacity to produce energy across the entire day, which the current RE system does do. So that, that's the main point that there's some questions around net versus gross. We've, we've come down on gross load trading, you know, individual slice trading could have been. I, we don't think that makes sense. Well, for 24 slices per day, yeah, it doesn't make sense. But if you have only four or six of them per day, it, it still doesn't make sense. Well, it's it's it, it most of them would be of no no value because they, the capacity is not going to be very valuable for them. Well, you but, should talk to PG and E. That's not our proposal. Okay, understood, 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 understood. Okay, I see one last hand raised from Zoomara. Is this a question for SE? Well, one of the downsides of this format is that um, we can't talk to other people on the, who are also participating. So it's actually related to SE, but it's uh, directed at Nick pa Pappas. And I'm wondering if Nick could um, respond. I've heard several times now that um, he's interested in having a transition. And given the fact that what we heard from the Energy Commission um, that most LSCs are already producing a lot of this information, um, and it looks like custom LSC um, load shapes could be uh, relatively easily produced. I'm wondering what Nick's concerns are about the need for a transition. What what's at the bottom of that? So if he could, res you know, if we can try to do that, um, I would appreciate it. Uh, if if the facilitators agree, I'm happy to jump in here. Although my my dog is actively very yeah. actively telling me she needs to walk. Um, but Sue, so I don't have concerns about it. It's really just a feasibility and implementation question. I, I think there's a lot of specification that is really beneficial or potential specification that's really beneficial in the slice of day constructs, both LSE specific, resource specific, et cetera. My my anxiety is trying to get you know, every LSE, it's load shape, every resource, it's production profile, technology, geography, et cetera, is, is just a lot to do in one transition, let's say in 2024. I would love to see that happen in 2024, but my anxiety is that it'll create a lot of headache and challenge and maybe imprecision as we're trying to calibrate this increasingly complex system. And, and again, increasingly complex, not a bad thing. It's kind of necessary. This is a you know, it's difficult to decarbonize the system, but just thinking about how do we mitigate the abruptness of those changes, uh, but certainly not opposed in concept to LSE specific load or and we support that and also support um, technological and geographic differentiation for uh, for resources. OK, I would just say in response that um, I th the Energy Commission is the one to tell us if this if they need a transition, if you ask me. I mean, um, LSCs already provide and have to collect a lot of this data that's needed. And if the Energy Commission says it can be done without a transition, then I think yeah, I think they're the ones that need to um, tell us uh, if they think a transition is needed. Thank you, thanks for uh, indulging me. May, may I offer just one additional comment there? <laughs> it's not too much to ask. I, I totally agree with that point, Sue, on the load forecast. There's an element that hasn't been discussed in great detail today, which is when we have the load forecast and the expected showings or what we think is you know, potentially expected showings, we have to calibrate this with a PRM. And so getting all of these pieces to fit together at the same time, um, may it's going to be more than just getting this from the CEC. There's many, many steps, I think, and a lot of calibration activity that's going to need to occur to avoid dramatic over procurement or under procurement. Um, so I just want to flag that this is a very complex machine we're trying to, to build here. OK, thanks for that. Uh, Kathleen Colbert, uh, last one before the, the launch break. Great, thanks. This is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. I'm just leaning in a little bit on the trading comment. Um, this is an issue that I think is really important um, to be 
clear under the proposals, like what you're thinking. Um, the what I have understood is that you've communicated your proposal on trading, transacting between a buyer and a seller would be a block contract, same as today, and 24 by 7 move. What is introducing complexity for me is hearing this idea of an obligation product between buyers that would have a different rule set. This could be traded on the same level of the slices. So for your proposal, 24 slices. I think it's possible if there's desire on the buyer side to create that market, that it could happen organically unless the proposal like explicitly discusses this. Um, and so I wanted to ask you to, if you could consider differentiating the trading, because even today you can sell off portions of a resource you contract. Um, I do see a comment in the chat. You're not selling off the same megawatt. You're selling off a portion of an NQC you've previously contracted to another buyer. So I think the the rule thing that's on the table is when this get when any of these get implemented, do we allow the transactions between buyers to be on the slice level to shape the requirement or not? And if you could add that kind of consideration to your proposal, that would help me a lot. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think we're pretty s strong on this one and, and pretty pretty sure that all transactions would be a, just a portion of the facility, not never slice by slice on the uh, on the resource side. So if it's a if it's a you know base load resource, it had you know 100 megawatt base load resource, it would count for 100 megawatt in every slice. If 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 LSE one bought the whole thing from the fr from the IPP. Uh, by all the RA attributes, they could sell portions of, of that to someone else, you know, 50 megawatts to, you know, party, you know, C, you know, the other 50 megawatts to, to, to party, you know, D, and that all, that all works. But, you know, it's, we're specifically saying that it's, it's not appropriate and, and not necessary to sell, be, you know, have a, have a way, have a structure to sell sl slice two of that, that, that of that contractor resource it's it's portions you know portions rather than than piece of the, of the slices or piece of the day um, I, heard, I heard something else in there too about yeah. buyers selling to buyers yeah. now are, are you talking about someone sort of like reselling a portion of their resource or are you talking about them somehow trading their load obligation um, I think you can think about it as trading their compliance requirement on a slice yeah, we're, or whatever we're slice that. is. We're not proposing that. We're proposing that each LSE has its own shape. It has to meet that shape, and it does so by trading, buying, selling, swapping resources so it can meet its shape. Uh, that, and uh, there might be an enhancement. We think that there's there's... There need to be some sort of demonstration that there was a compelling reason why that framework wasn't reasonably efficient uh, before we would uh, explore uh, some sort of obligation trading. Uh, and just to share with you, it's in a proposal that includes obligation trading is one that is less attractive. So that's why I think it was it would help a lot if you could be explicit about that. I think it's one of the items that will have the most commercial impact. Thanks. So I, I know there's people that are out there, uh, but yep. that's not what we're. It's just for clarity. There's, we're not proposing load obligation trading. Your your load shape is your load shape based on the conversations we've been having. That's your obligation, and um, your resources are 24 hour whatever full capability must offer you by a portion or all of a resource. Uh, you don't trade slices, you trade resources. Okay, I see Doug Carpa immediately raise his hand. So let, let's try to close this loop before we go on, on break. Yeah, sorry to keep everybody from lunch. Uh, no, um, I think um, Cal CCA, um, or at least Peninsula Clean Energy, is one of the groups that is really interested in the um, obligation trading simply because, you know, from the standpoint of an LSC that, um, you know, we have a particular load shape. It's really not guaranteed that there's any combination of slices of resources, like 24 hour strips that can like 
really exactly meet our our load so that you know we could be in a situation where we've got a lot of solar and storage and you know a bunch of of wind and maybe some geothermal but then we have some like stubborn chunk that's between three and five in the morning that we can't meet and so in order to do that what we'd have to do basically is like buy a slice of a wind resource just to fill that section and then we've got all the other hours that we don't need um or alternatively if we are if we are long in a in a few hours when somebody else is short that's where it makes sense economically to like say hey we will meet that little slice that you haven't quite been able to fill um and so that's that's sort of the rationale behind it and i and i suspect that it may be something that either pce or cal cca will have to kind of put in as a supplement supplemental proposal yeah um, sure 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 yeah, yeah. And I'm just I'm curious what the objection to that is. And part of the reason for, you know, we've been talking about this internally, so there's no guarantees that this is where we'll land because there's not even internal agreement among CCAs about the advisability here. Um, but I'm, of course, always interested in what objections to that are. Uh, personally, I see it as being a simpler construct than, you know, what may be hourly trading with resource generators, although maybe that's valuable for generators to want to do that. So. You know, maybe so, that's the term. So, you know, we haven't modeled this too much, but if it, it, it at least in the model that, w that we've done, the expectation is that dispatchable resources, if they're, if you're, if an LSC is long all other hours and short a couple hours, uh, you know, applying a dispatchable resource, a uh, use limited dispatchable resource, for example, a nine hour peaker or, or a four hour battery or some other resource added to the mix will then cover whatever short um, it, it, it is there. So so the, the, my the expectation is that through additional procurement or swaps, um, this could, the LSE would be able to cover uh, those gaps. And I just say that I, yeah. I, 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 it, to me, it seems like 90 plus percent of the problem can be traded uh, through trading, can be treated with the trading. You know, just my, our, my, my view and our position I've gotten here. And there may be a little bit left on the table, but no one's quantified what that is. But if we're to adopt a structure to allow obligation trading, that's going to require a whole new system, a whole new dimension, a whole new tracking, a whole new showing demonstration process, a whole new infrastructure to support that. So it, I, I, my view is that uh, I, unless someone demonstrates a compelling need to create all that new infrastructure and complexity, we should give it a shot with what we think is the existing tools on the table. And if it, if it proves that we need to enhance, great. When we have some data to demonstrate that it really is worth the time and effort, you know, fine. But but I, 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 I think that the, because there's such a burden added to the systems, it's a burden on people asking for that to demonstrate that it's necessary. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that, that's helpful. Thank you. Both of those points. OK, so uh, thanks to uh, Darius, Jeff, Brent and Lynn for for your presentations. I think we had a very productive morning session so that let's take a 30 minute lunch break. Uh, the, the difference with the agenda will be, you know, moving in the last Q&A session mm -hmm. that we have uh, a schedule from 2.30 to 4. So now it would be like 2.45 to, to 4. Uh, so let's meet uh, back at 12.45 for Vistra's and Gridwall's presentation. And the the question queue, uh, queue is clear. So we'll we'll start again there. Thanks, everyone.